Hi, Physio students. I hope that you um, finished the POGOL on the heart valves on the cardiovascular system. I think if you did, you got a good look at how things flow. So a lot of things move in your cardiovascular system and respiratory system using passive processes and a lot of the like, like diffusion or osmosis, which are based on the second law of thermodynamics, which is about how um, matter moves in response to areas that are organized into more and less. Things will move always from an area of high concentration or high pressure or high temperature to an area of lower concentration, pressure, or temperature until they're randomly distributed. And that idea is called entropy. So um, you did the POGOL, which really talked about the flow of blood always from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure, and your heart, by changing volumes of chambers, has the capacity to change the pressure in an area and make it be higher in some, time, some moments and lower in other moments. But there's also the flow of blood through your blood vessels. So this section is going to be more about blood vessels and how the flow changes in response to the diameter and in response to the... Um, viscosity in response to the bumps and the things along the side of the road. So it's kind of like when you're in the bloodstream, it's kind of like you're in a little raft if you are a red blood cell and you're with a bunch of other little red blood cells floating through the different vessels and they're going to be different sizes at different times. So I thought this little rafting image was good. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to go rafting, but it's a lot like that. The first part of your packet, you should have your packet out with you so you can take notes on it while I'm talking away, is about um, the different types of blood vessels. So all of the blood vessels always have, and um, there's all these different types, they have an opening in the inside of them called the lumen, and this, the size of that lumen or opening can get larger if they're dilating. It's called vasodilation when your vessels dilate. Or the smooth muscles that are around the edge of them can constrict and make them smaller or narrower. The vessels we've mentioned before that go away from your heart are called arteries. And I can tell this is an artery because it has a thicker wall. And this is a vein. Veins have a larger lumen and a thinner wall. This is a little smaller artery, so we'd call that an arteriole. And this is probably a little smaller vein, so we might call that a venule. And eventually, blood going away from large arteries branches into smaller and smaller branches called arterioles. So this is a diagram you can look on page 185 in your packet where you have to label the three different types of vessels. And this is showing some of the important differences between arteries, veins, and capillaries. So they all they have three layers. The inner layer called the tunic means like a layer, tunica intima is always really smooth and frictionless, made with simple squamous epithelium so that there's little resistance to the blood as they bump along the edge of it. Then there's a smooth muscle layer called the tunica media, and that's the layer with the smooth muscles that can make it constrict or relax and dilate. And the outermost layer is an elastic layer called the tunica externa. Your arteries have an additional elastic layer that helps them recoil so that your arteries get the most pressure in them of blood when it gets squirted into them and they stretch open and then the elastic recoil makes them fall back again and that actually helps propel blood along a little more. Veins don't have that much pressure in them, but veins is just the blood trickling back from your extremities towards your heart. And so they have these little valves added in them to prevent blood from going backwards, especially when it's going against gravity, like in your legs. So you have all your blood in your feet and your toes has to get pushed without a lot of pressure all the way back up to your heart. So there are some mechanisms for getting blood to come back in your heart. One of the mechanisms is using your muscles that are around them to squeeze them. Sometimes people who don't walk enough, who stand a lot in one place, will get their veins to, to fail, They'll get blood accumulating right above where the valve is as it's not moving along and it'll stretch their veins out and you'll start to see the veins like bulging out of their skin on their legs. Veins are usually located closer to your skin. They're more superficial than arteries are 
because they don't have as much blood pressure in them, if you prick a vein, you bleed a little bit, but then a clot forms and you stop bleeding. If you prick an artery though, arteries with this huge amount of pressure in them, the pressure would cause the blood to squirt out and it might even squirt out in pulses like the way that you feel the pulse when you're feeling an artery like this. Capillaries are just made of the innermost layer, the endothelium, and they're designed to be really thin so that diffusion can occur. So this diagram is showing some of the ways that will help your veins get the blood back to your heart even when it's defying gravity. Um, it's called a milking action. When you tense a muscle, it squeezes around the veins and that pushes the blood out of them. And since they have these valves, it only pushes it in one direction. This is an area where if you didn't use your muscles, you could get pooling around it and get varicose veins. The other mechanism I talked about in the last video, when you inhale air into your lungs, you're making a larger area of your chest cavity. So the volume of the cavity is larger and that makes it have a relatively lower pressure because PV equals NRT. So pressure and volume are inversely proportional. The same negative pressure that pulls air into your lungs when you inhale will also pull blood into your thoracic cavity when you inhale. So exercising is really good at keeping your veins, getting the blood moving through them and keeping them healthy. Actually, even though capillaries are really, really tiny, the total sum of the surface area of all your capillaries is greater than the total sum of all, this, of all the area in your arteries. So when blood gets to the capillary beds, because there's lots of them, it um, slows down. Just like if you were rafting down a river and you were in a narrow channel of the river, you'd be going really fast. But then when it gets really wide, like a lake, then the velocity of the water slows down and you cruise a little slower. Capillary beds allow blood flow to slow down while it's in this area, and then diffusion can happen more easily when the blood is not moving as fast. You don't have enough blood to be in all of your capillaries at the same time. So you have these little sphincters, muscles around some of the true capillaries, and just a single avenue called the vascular shunt that can keep blood moving through your circulatory system without filling that whole area with blood. So when we talk about blood going out of your muscles and into your small intestine, say when you're in a parasympathetic coma after Thanksgiving, then the blood vessels in your muscles would look like this and the blood vessels in your digestive tract would look like this. In a fight or flight response, the opposite would occur. These little sphincters would constrict and you'd have no blood flow going into your stomach and these little sphincters would relax you have vasodilation in all the capillaries in your muscles, and then you'd be able to run or um, fight and save your life. So um, there are a lot of different forces that help diffusion occur at, in your capillary beds. The concentration differences, you have more oxygen in your blood and less in your cells. Um, for oxygen and nutrients will help things diffuse from an area of high to low concentration. You also have pressure, like actual pressure, like when you pump up your tires, your blood is under pressure and the pressure is changing as it as your blood moves through your vessels. The pressure in your blood compared to the pressure in the cells around it can help things move through these little pores or through the little spaces between cells or just diffuse right through the simple squamous cells that are in your um, capillaries. You also have osmotic pressure, how much pressure uh, the dissolved solutes in your interstitial fluid compared to your plasma are that are going to help things flow in and out of your capillaries. So there's all, all of these forces are always things moving from an area of high concentration, osmotic pressure, um, uh, blood pressure to an area of lower pressure. It, within the heart, we've always been looking at diagrams where the right side was the blue side and the left side was the red side. And that's true while the blood is in your heart. But once it goes out of your heart, you have red arteries going to both sides of your body, everywhere in your body. Same with your veins. And they're branching out, branching out, getting smaller and smaller. Smaller veins are getting bigger and bigger and bigger as blood comes back to your heart. The names of the arteries and veins are often named for things you've already learned, like the bones, the femoral artery, the radial artery, the ulnar artery, or um, regions. But a lot of them are just named for the body organ or the bone that they're near. 
some places in your body, unlike tree branches in a tree that always branch apart and don't ever come back together again, some areas in your circulatory system have circles. So there are alternate routes in case one blood vessel gets clogged or damaged, blood can still get to an area by going in another route, kind of like the streets of Lafayette. There's not just a single street. Well, there kind of is going up to Morocco, but there's anastomoses are these of alternate routes that blood can get to different places. After your blood comes from your digestive tract, it immediately always goes over and goes through your liver so that it can get anything toxic can get filtered out of it. And your liver is also analyzing whether um, what your blood glucose concentrations are like and deciding, do I need to take this glucose and store it as glycogen? Or does this blood have really low glucose and should we start breaking apart our glycogen and putting some glucose out into the bloodstream? A special type of circulation occurs in fetuses because before you're born, you're not actually breathing air in through your respiratory system. You're not actually eating and putting food in your digestive system, but everything for a fetus is coming through this placenta, which is a combination of the mom's blood and the baby's blood getting right next to each other. So the baby can get oxygen and food and other nutrients from its mother, and it can get rid of its waste through its mother's body systems by traveling through the placenta. The fetal hemoglobin is slightly different than regular hemoglobin so that it has a higher affinity and will take the oxygen out of the mom's blood and take it into the fetus's blood. So that blood comes to the baby through the umbilical cord. Umbilical cord is an artery in a vein. This vessel is going towards the baby's heart, so it's called a vein. The umbilical vein is bright red, unlike other um, veins within your normal body. And then it goes to the heart. There are a lot of little holes between the right and left side of the heart that allow the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood to mix because it's actually not getting oxygenated and deoxygenated between the right and left side of the heart. It's getting oxygenated and deoxygenated in the placenta. There's a couple of asterisk areas. You are labeling the foramen ovale, which is located between the two atria, the ductus venosus, which is bypassing the liver. You're noticing the umbilical vein and umbilical arteries and the ductus arteriosus is this little hole I think we talked about in the last um, video on heart anatomy. The heart it starts functioning as an active pump pretty on it. And flip to page 196 in your packet in this little paragraph. The heart starts acting as a functional pump by the fourth week of development. And this woman, bought herself a little handheld Doppler because she wanted to hear the heart rate of her babies. When you first get pregnant, if it's not an accident and you were really trying to get pregnant, it's super exciting to be able to hear the baby's heart actually functioning as a pump when you're say eight weeks pregnant and you don't even really look pregnant at all yet. You know you're pregnant, the test came back correctly, but it's really exciting to really hear this little living thing. This is just the verbiage that goes with the pictures that you labeled on the previous page. The ductus arteriosus and foramen ovale allow the blood to bypass the non-functioning fetal lungs. And the ductus venosus bypasses the fetal liver. So the baby's blood is bypassing these parts because those organs aren't really doing anything for them yet. The oxygen and nutrients are arriving to the baby's heart via the umbilical vein that's carrying blood from the placenta to the baby's heart. And then wastes are removed, like carbon dioxide and any nitrogenous wastes are removed from the fetus's blood by the art, uh, umbilical arteries. So just like your pulmonary system, the red and the blue were backwards for these compared to most arteries and veins, the umbilical, uh, umbilical cord has the blood vessels in kind of the backwards coat. When um, birth occurs, the bypass structures get blocked, but sometimes they don't get blocked. And apparently half of all infant deaths resulting from congenital defects are due to those bypass structures failing. I know a lot of students who said, I was a blue baby, I was a blue baby. So I know not all of them result in death because a lot of people get over it and their little um, holes close up later on.